This is the tagline. Life happens. And when it does, you have to be okay with starting over. There's nothing wrong with it. In all actuality, it's actually a blessing more than it is a curse. Starting over gives you an opportunity to have a new chance at it. So why not take it? That's what today's episode is all about. And joining us on the show today is a very, very, very special guest. Former Pro Bowl NFL starting quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, Mr. Mike Barilla. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, my name is Wise, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. Roll the clip. Randy Corson. Keep on, keep on, keep on. Shine and shine. Yo, what's up, people? Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wise, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. And to my left, I have an incredible person, a former Philadelphia Eagle, a Stanford quarterback, Mr. Mike Barella. How you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. It is great to be here with you, Wise. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we're living large here in Denver, Colorado, <laughs> and uh, it, it's really good to be here at your studio. Really oh, like thank it. you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I want to give a special shout out, first and foremost, to my cameraman, Brian. I mean, he he he, he made the connection, so um, I really want to thank him for just, you know, just bringing you on the show. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, right? Right. And so today's episode is all about starting over. And I'm and as a, a a man of your caliber, I'm pretty sure you can uh I'm pretty sure you started over too many times to count or, or you moved in a lot of different directions. And uh this podcast is all about the mental health and uh I want to you know we're going to touch on some subjects just to help us um you know just navigate a little bit. Um but first, tell the people, just for the people who don't know who you are, tell the people like a general gist of who you are as Mike Barilla. Okay, I am a, a former Stanford University All-American quarterback. Mm -hmm. I'm a former Pro Bowl quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I became an attorney uh, after I played football, and I graduated number two in my law school class and got a, 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 a master's in tax uh, degree, which is an advanced law degree. And then about 12 years ago, uh, the, the Lord morphed me into a playwright mm. and a, a one-man play stage actor. And why that's so unusual for me is like when I went to Regis High School here mm -hmm. and I, when I was at Stanford, I was the quietest guy on the team. I, I was just a nervous wreck talking to people. And the Lord changed me into a, a playwright and I did a, a one-man play uh, stage uh, performance called the disappearing quarterback, which is a uh, which is also a, a, a book that you uh, that you currently right. have out, and that's I have like I've really expanded my disappearing quarterback series. I have a one man play mm -hmm. called the disappearing quarterback, which I performed fifty times in Philadelphia and Denver. Yes, sir. And then I uh, also had a version of the musical version of of it. Uh, called The Disappearing Quarterback, Dog Days Are Over, which I staged here at the uh, L.A. Calkins, uh Opera House in the, in the world-famous Denver Performing Arts Center right, right before COVID. Amazing. And I was the stage director and on stage uh, for two hours and 15 minutes with other musicians, dancers, and singers. It was just a wonderful experience. And then about... Ooh, just about a year ago, uh, I, I launched, uh, and then my one-man play, The Disappearing Quarterback, mm -hmm. I did record as an audiobook. Okay. So okay. if anybody yes, wants to uh, listen to it, just Google The Disappearing Quarterback. It's a one-hour audiobook. And then I wrote The Case of the Disappearing Quarterback, which was published by Westward. Uh, it took him six months to publish it in January of this year. It's Amazing. called The Case of the Disappearing Quarterback. Congratulations. And sir. next week, this is why this is good timing. Yes, sir. To have yes, you yes, let's and go ahead and go like into to it. announce that this is going to be pitched to 100 
uh, movie producers in Hollywood by my hand-picked Hollywood agent to be made into a six-part Netflix TV series. That in Hopefully. itself. It's not even a hopefully. You already got yeah, it. Yeah, that's why I feel it's. it's you already it's a got done it. Deal. God has already aligned it. He wouldn't give you that opportunity if you wasn't already prepared for it, and if things weren't already going to be aligned for you. So right. I know that you already have it. I can't wait. Uh, by the time this episode comes out, it's going to be. That's going to be the crazy part of it. <laughs> the fact that the timing of this is going to coincide with that. Um, so one of my first questions I want to ask you is. Um, the case of the disappearing quarterback, your book, just within the first pages, it it looked it, it looked and it sounded like there was a like some trauma just initially from your very first memory, um, and then because uh, because in the first few pages of me reading, um, it was about your dad and you were at a Knicks game. Yeah. Can, can you dive into that? Like at, at what I believe what eight years old or six or six years old? I was Sorry. actually six years old. Six years and old. It yes. actually is my first memory. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. So can you uh, dive into that and just tell people about sure. what what did that look like and how that kind of shaped your life as you kind of saw it in your in your formative years, especially maybe during high school, early college. Right. Uh, I was six years old. My dad was an all pro basketball player for the New York Knicks, mm. the world famous iconic New York Knicks, and he was so big his nickname was Moose. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, he was also the, the head, became the head basketball coach. And oddly enough, when I was six years old, I was sitting on the bench of the New York Knicks in the Philadelphia arena. Okay, the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia basketball, basketball. Where I later became an all-pro quarterback. And anyway, to make a long story short, uh, my dad had three technical fouls called on him. He's... Uh, as I got older, I realized my dad was a psychopath. Uh, and I figured mm. that out about 12 years ago. He has complete anger management I issues. He went totally berserk. I'm this little six-year-old boy sitting on the bench, and he is bouncing and just storming up and down using every foul let, uh, word you could think of on these referees. They called all the technicals on him, and then they threw him out, out of the, the game. game. Uh, did okay, they throw him out of the game. How are you well, going to coach your team if you're, out, if yeah, you're out of the game? Well, most of the time, coaches would leave. He's the first guy in the history of the NBA. He went straight jacket berserk and refused to leave. Hmm. So it was the first time in NBA history where they had to call in armed guards and escort Moose out of the armed stadium. Armed guards. Armed guards. From outside the arena to oh, escort man. him out. You got to realize he was 6'5". He was huge. Oh, yeah, five. huge guy. You're, little, not, you're not taking him down. Their little referees back then <laughs> looked like munchkins. It was like the Tin Man versus the munchkins. But anyway, uh, this uh, it's odd that this would be my first memory. And one of the reasons why is when I was with the Philadelphia Eagles, the top sports writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, set aside a room for an interview with me. Mm -hmm. And I had never had this happen before. Usually when they interview you, they interview you in the, in the locker room or in front of him. And he goes, he got a room and said, Mike, I, can I interview you in, in a side room away from everybody? And he goes, sure, I can do that. I went in there. His name is Gordon Forbes. Okay. He was a big deal back then. And he, uh, he's has passed away. But the reason why he set up this room was he wanted to tell me, that he was behind the bench at that game in oh, Philadelphia. Man. And he was, uh, okay, I was six. He was like 12 or 15. And he said, you know, Mike, when I was at that game, the people behind the bench were scared to death because your dad was completely out of control. So, 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 so my second. So he, oh, so he, he, told me to, to, he told me about this. I didn't mention to him that I was on the bench too, but he just wanted me to know that that he was part. He saw that, and mm -hmm. so because I think he brought it up again, uh, this memory stuck with me, and it helped me understand that. And the reason why I put it in that book is that I want people, and I talk about it more in my subsequent book, okay. which came out uh, two months ago, called "My Favorite Year." Yes, sir. I wanted to talk. And I wasn't quite ready to, in the case of the Supreme Court, that my father was a psychopath. 
And because I've started talking about that in the last 10 years, once I got away from him, because they, they're scary, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't, you know, I, he, he, he would make my life miserable if he knew I was calling him a psychopath. <laughs> at a certain point, I, I didn't care. But as I started talking to people about psychopaths, my father being a psychopath, I have maybe met 10 people where their father was a psychopath too. Mm. And so I okay. really feel like it's part of my ministry to tell people about how this incredibly famous man, and he became the uh, general manager of the Nuggets, became the general manager of the uh, Utah Stars, very famous man, loved by hundreds, but he had this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality. So how did that shape, I guess you would say, your, your mental as a kid? It, As a kid I, I, growing I, up. You know, I've asked the Lord about that, and it's I can't tell you how much it's helped me because what I really and I discussed this with my artistic director. Uh, when I when I uh, I had studied actors uh, when I was getting ready for my play, the three actors I studied were Carol Burnett, Sam Shepard, and that one guy who was the Godfather. I forget his name, Marlon Brando. Okay. The top three actors of the generation before me. Do you know all three of them were raised by alcoholic, psychopathic fathers? Oof. I did not. I did not. Okay. That, I, well, I that, found that you out. You found that out. Uh, Carol Burnett, they had to move him, move her away, and she was raised by a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And they're all raised by alcoholic, psychopathic. And I go, because what happened to me when I got on stage People thought I had been acting since I was a little boy. So that came from, I would say, like your childhood and also your, I, your father's... I, I, I talked about it with my artist. He said, Mike, and then my friend Charlie Young has told him, you've been acting since you were a little boy. And when, mm. I, when I had to be around my dad and his psychopathic mm -hmm. friends that were all alcoholics and they were always asking me questions, I had to put on a mask and kind of uh, hide my real true self. But I remember one time when I was at Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, there was a crowd of people outside the uh, theater, and they were waiting for me, okay, okay, to come out. And they all looked like movie stars. They were all dressed up. They were the some of the top actors, stage oh, actors time. in Philadelphia, and they wanted to ask me some questions. And I, I remember this one young lady, really well dressed, very pretty, said, "How long have you been acting?" And I said. Oh, about two weeks, because I had just been acting for two weeks. That she, that was the training for you. Yeah, that was she, quote she, unquote the training. She just her. looked at me. She go, "You've only been acting for this is your first play." I go, yeah, this is my first play. I've never done it. And I go, and then I go, but you gotta also realize, I was raised by a psychopathic father. I've probably been acting since I was a little boy. Uh, so uh, when uh, I got on stage, I remember thinking all the time on stage. You know, we're, I'm talking sold out. They had a, there weren't enough seats, so they had to put them on stage. Right, like 15 people sitting on stage because they couldn't sit. They had they ran out of seats for yes, the more place. Set tickets. And I, I was sitting in front of all these people, former football player, one man play. I I go I go on stage and I don't leave for 85 minutes. And you know what? It was fun. It was easy for me. And I remember thinking, it's easy. It is really easy. <laughs> To act in front of human beings, it's really difficult to act in front of psychopaths. That so 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 that conclusion you came from just by just by your experiences through life as growing up as this kid who who's like man my dad is a whole psychopath so how do I I didn't know it as I didn't you know, know it word. as a child yeah I, as a child I didn't know about the word till about fifteen years ago gotcha psychopath yeah. uh, I just knew there was something wrong with him. That's and I, go, I had a similar, I had a similar instance I go, with just my I didn't own know mental. what it was, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what it was, but you know, as a little boy, you, I mean, I don't think the word psychopath got developed till about twenty years ago. I don't, yeah, I don't think it was about maybe twenty, right, thirty years right. ago, because so, so, they, you, you finally, we finally are able to classify things that uh that are wrong with us or that were, quote unquote, I guess 
so to speak, a diagnostics of some sort um, or some tr- uh, treatment or whatever, just to make sure that, hey, what's going on with you? We need to categorize you. That's the word. I'm sorry. Right. We need to categorize you in something uh, in order in order for us to make do of how to handle you. Um, so I just want to fast forward a little bit. OK, so that happened at the age of six. By the time you got to high school, when did football um, really start to play a a big role in your life? I started playing quarterback mm-hmm. and calling my own plays when I was in third grade. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, so it okay, goes way okay, back. So way I from. go third grade, and then I went to high school. I went to, uh, just so everybody knows, I went to Regis High School down the street here. Mm-hmm. And I loved being a quarterback. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think I have quarterback in my DNA. I just loved it. Uh, I was also the all-state basketball player. Oh, okay, didn't and know so, that. Awesome. And so my dad goes, "You ain't gonna play football in co- college because I had all these all these uh, basketball scholarships, mm-hmm. so like Notre Dame." He goes, "You're not playing football because you're gonna get hurt." My senior year, he didn't wouldn't even let me play football at Regis High School. So how did so so how did that how did work? I get, with how did I get to play Reed? Uh, how, yeah, how did I got play my basketball coach, Guy Gibbs. I went to him and said. Mr. Gibbs, you got to talk to my dad. He won't let me play football, and I want to play football. And you know all the guys want me to play football. Mm-hmm. I was I was six four and a half. I could throw the football really well. Mm-hmm. Everybody on the team was counting on me to be in there. And I go, you got to talk my dad into letting me play football. So my basketball coach went to my dad and talked him into letting me play football. The power of, conv- uh, of convincing. <laughs> so <laughs> I talked to him about this ten years ago, and uh, and he goes, he just we just laughed about it. But uh, so I went to, I was a, a, a interesting high school career at at Regis, and it was mm-hmm. really embarrassing for me, really embarrassing for me because I was so shy and quiet. But my next door neighbor was the top TV sports newscaster in the state of Colorado. His nickname was. His name was Star Yellen, and he gave me as much airtime as some of the Denver Broncos. And that's where the, the I guess, the publicity came with, in for, yeah, for I, everything else. That I was the most publicized uh, high school athlete probably in the in the history of the state of Colorado up to that time. With that type of and, media, yeah, and I, <laughs> I, and I hated it. I why? hated it. Why, why did you I hate was, it? I was like Greta Garbo. I want to be alone. Because of your shyness. Uh, yeah, I was shy. Because I, of your shyness. I don't want people to pay attention to me. Stop it. But you're this, but you're this all-star at, at that level of yeah. high school, all-star quarterback. You're getting, you're getting tons I, of notoriety. Like I was the gold helmet award winner. Was the gold, okay, yeah. gotcha. I got the gold helmet, and it's we finally put it up. <laughs> okay. I, I put it in a trunk. I just didn't want to show it. I don't know why. We finally put it up uh, actually last month in a bookcase in our den. Awesome. Awesome. I have a gold helmet there and a picture of me at Stanford and some of the game balls that I got, Philadelphia. So uh, so I kind of had to battle my psychopathic father. And actually, uh, I, in, in my, my more recent book, My Favorite Year, I talk about mm-hmm. how I'm glad I had my dad because first of all, he helped me become a great actor, but it's because of my my dad Moose that I'm six four and a half. Mm-hmm. I have size sixteen and a half. <laughs> triple E shoe. Triple E. My Eagles coach used to always say, "Look at my shoes. my feet," and he goes, "That's why it's so hard to knock you off your feet." Right. That balance. The, yeah. That balance <laughs> and, coming and from then, those feet. Yeah. And then you, I have you're, you're hands so big I can palm a basketball, which enables me to throw a tight spot. Mm. And it's I have all these physical gifts that make a perfect quarterback because I was the son of Moose. Right. So, so I got uh, a question for you then. Um, if if you didn't do football, do you think like the trajectory of your of your life would be different with basketball, or do you think it would primarily even be the same? Well, you know, my best friend Charlie Young, who's a former All Pro tight end for the Eagles, we've talked about this and. He told me this. He goes, Mike, because I, I, I was a few years ago, I was really mad about football because I have had so many friends that died. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. And I was getting really bitter about it. And he goes, Mike, there's no need to be bitter because look how you survived. And it, the thing is, Mike, you got to realize you're a quarterback. They're like the, the, the star of the show. You're the cream of the crop. And the, being the quarterback 
especially at a place like Philadelphia, has given you a platform in which you can write your stuff and people will read it. And I, I believe, I really believe now, and I've come to terms with playing football, even all my dead friends, is God had me be a football player to give me a platform to write this book, The Case of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubt it's going to be a six-part Netflix TV series. I believe and, it. Now, I if I would have been a, a basketball player, no. Probably I don't not. think so. But being the all-pro quarterback uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles, and right now, just this last month, the top rider on planet Earth, mm -hmm. the top rider on planet Earth, planet Earth okay. sells more books than anyone on, what's, what's the name of this pl the planet again? Oh, yeah. Oh, Earth. Earth, yeah, Earth yeah. this thing called Earth. It, yeah, we well, know. his name is James Patterson. <laughs> okay. All the murder mysteries. Uh, yes. Well, guess what he just wrote a book about? Uh. Last month. Published it. Really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And okay. my, my wife got it from the library, and I just looked at it, and I go, Oh, my word. I can't believe this. I just read this two weeks ago. He wrote a book with this other person, mm -hmm. just got published, uh, will sell a gazillion copies, called Lion and Lamb. And the main character, of course, is a Pro Bowl quarterback uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. That's you. <laughs> yeah. that, that sounds like yeah. you right there. Well, if you read the back of my cover right, the, yes. uh, of the case I talk about. Yes, I read that. Yes, I know, read that. Yes, sir. And anyway, he does get whacked just like the back of my cover uh -huh. in the first chapter. Ooh. But it's it's a story all about the Philadelphia Eagles. But anyway, he just wrote a book about – I'm doing that to say, like, Charlie's right. I have a platform. I'm a former Pro Bowl quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. There's just not a whole lot of those. There's not a whole lot of those. And yeah, your story, yeah. uh, because you've, uh, because the life expectancy, as we talked actually off camera right. about it, the life expectancy of a quarterback is no more than what, like the age of 52, maybe 55, because right. taking all those hits every single Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday, even even on Thursdays, uh, from these six five. 300 pound lineman coming at you at 20 miles an hour it's like yeah that that kind of that kind of wears and tears on your body and on your mind and your mental and so starting over actually in that uh that kind of correlates to where we're going in the in the in the conversation of starting over in those multiple stages it may be harder for a quarterback to do and it's 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 uh it can be kind of depressing to a degree if you if it's not treated properly or taken care of properly over the years so Yes, sir. One of the things about you know your, your concept here of starting over, I actually am much more comfortable in my personality with being a stage person mm -hmm. rather than a, a football person. I feel much more comfortable doing that. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, thinking about it, I go, this is really where I belong. Uh, I and where belong. did that come from? Like, where did that? Did I don't know where, where it came where from. Did it come from. I think, I think, I think it was a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And and when I was doing my my play, okay. Now you're talking this play, and and I, I people when I took me out to dinner afterwards and they'd ask me questions. One of the things they asked me one time, the the executive of the um, the theater had eight of his fraternity brother of Penn, Penn State, and they took me out to the best uh, steakhouse on the East Coast. Okay. And they all asked me questions. One of the guys said, how do you look so relaxed up there? You've really been doing I, it your whole said, life. No, no, I hadn't been. Well, well here's, so, what, well, I, here's well, what I told him. Six. I said, because this is what I did. Before I would go on stage, I, would, I started telling most of my stories to my mom when I was hmm. growing up. It was always my mom because she would take me away from my dad. Mm -hmm. And she'd grab my hand, take me in the living room. So a lot of the stories that I told in the disappearing quarterback, I first told my mom. I go, I said, when I when I'm on off stage, I um, I just pretend that I'm going out on stage in my mom's living room and telling her my stories. And I and I, I told him also, the Lord told me when I uh, did when I started on my play, he, he said, Mike, this is reward for you for all the writing you've done, because I've been writing for about five years before that. Okay. And I just, and he tells me, just, I want you to do, enjoy this. And I, I never got nervous at all. I wouldn't get nervous at all. And mm -hmm. I remember, like, my um, artistic director, the, the three days before the world premiere, mm -hmm. 
he came up to me and he was sitting down because we really became close. He says, Mike, it's okay to be scared to death. <laughs> and I go, Sometimes scared? having the nerves. Yeah, that's what he said. I go, scared to death? I'm not going to be scared. In fact, I'm not going to be nervous at all. He goes, you're not? He goes, no. I was never even nervous when I started at quarterback. That's what I, and that was my, I, that's going to be my got, next I question. I never got nervous. Even, even like in your Stanford years or when you actually no. got to the league, you were never nervous about and that. I was calling games. my own plays as a rookie. I started that's three unheard games of. as a rookie, and we won all three. It was an NFL record, the first rookie quarterback to win three games in a row. Mm-hmm. Called all my own plays. I never got nervous before the games. So I never got nervous before the play. Right. Okay. Just like this, I never got nervous before this. Even though this is the biggest <laughs> talk show so far. Not, sh- not yet. Not west yet. of the Mississippi. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're speaking into existence for me. Um, let's touch on your Stanford years, right? So let's say, okay, you're, so, so you're out of high school. You go to college. Are you automatically the starting guy? No. Uh, no. Well, as, soon, as soon as you get in, oh yeah. So, so tell me, so tell me, how does that transpire? How does starting over in college uh, shape you uh, from previously in high school? Like, how does that transition for you? Do you want me to tell a story I tell in my book? Sure, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, on the th- my freshman year, on the Thursday before first game, the head freshman coach moved me to wide receiver. Mm. And I had been playing quarterback since I was a little third grade. And in front of the whole team, he said, Mike, and he kept bringing this up in front of the whole team, Mm -hmm. on the sweeps, you got a crack back block on those USC middle line men. <laughs> we were playing USC. USC of all University teams. of Southern California. Yes, sir. Down in LA. Oh, no. And he goes, you got to crack back block on those guys. You got you to gotta hurt them. Crack back block. And I'm sitting there going, what in God's name is a crack back block? What is that? Yeah. I have no <laughs> idea. I can't throw a crack back. I've just been a quarterback. And, and so anyway, I was flying down with the team, and I was sitting next to my friend, and, and I only use nicknames in, in the book. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, my favorite year, his nickname was Jungle Joe. He was our defensive lineman, 6'5", defensive lineman. And he had been like the all-state defensive lineman. He goes, gotcha. Mike, I played football with the two uh, – all-star game with the two middle linebackers for USC. One is Sam Cunningham, and the other one is – The legendary. Char- the other one is Charlie Young. Oof. He goes, they're both 6'5 and weigh 235 pounds. You better protect yourself because they're going to knock your head off. And they're not going to care about it afterwards. They're yeah, and so uh, see, part at that of the time, game. maybe I was 185, maybe 180. And so <laughs> I am going down. He goes, you better be careful on the crackback box because he made such a big deal about these crackback blocks. So I'm just going down there. And I, I can't even enjoy looking at the USC cheerleaders who met us at the plane. And I'm scared to death. I'm, I'm really thinking this is it. This is it. You're going to die. This is it. This, <laughs> this is it. Are you going to get paralyzed? We've, yeah. we've seen it. We've seen it <laughs> in later years. This is it. This, I am Especially gonna, at those football uh, arenas. I was thinking about arenas. calling up Father Bakewell from Regis High School and have him give me the last rights over the phone. Oh my yeah, god. But anyway, I was <laughs> I was literally scared to death. Yes, sir. And so, uh honest to God, <laughs> it's unbelievable, but uh on the very first series of plays, Charlie Young went on a blitz. A bl- it's called a blindside blitz. Okay. Yeah. Where you where you kind of uh, curve like that and go on the blind side where the quarterback cannot see you. And he creamed uh, the starting quarterback his name was jim wise and he blew out his knee oh jim wise was the la times player of the year and was going to be the next quarterback at stanford Mm. jim wise never played another down of football again for uh stanford just from that first just from those first few series okay he 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 had his knee operated right then Mm -hmm. and then uh two years later uh, in a spring game, he had his shoulder separated and got that operation. Never played. Never played it, yeah. But anyway, Charlie Young did that. And um, 
And so, like, I am scared to death at that point. Gotcha. So they, okay. they pulled right. a quarterback, and they put in my friend, P. Mo is his, his name, and they put him at quarterback, and I am just scared to death at that point. And so, anyway, what happened was whenever I had to the sweeps on the crap back, right. <laughs> okay. I would somehow mysteriously, I would slip and fall. Mysteriously, <laughs> I would, right? I would fall on the ground. By and accident. Go, oh, God. Oh, the play's <laughs> over with. No sense me going there. And then I, P. Mo was a great passer, and I was a good receiver. I caught six passes. Awesome. Awesome. And one, one of the passes that I caught, I remember, was a curl pattern. Okay. Yep. I went down. Down. And you Most came. of the other ones were out, you know, outs. I went down and a curl inside. And then I thought, oh, my God, I'm near the middle where Cover Charlie two. and Sam are. Right. And I go, <laughs> Oh God! I turned on a dime and ran out of bounds. And then, when I uh, went back to the huddle, I was scared to death to look at the size of Charlie and Sam. So I would w- run down the sidelines, and then once I got past their huddle, and then I would take a, a, a direct right turn and go into the huddle. And oh I never my saw, gosh! I never, I never put my eyes on them. I was, just, I just so you just so you so nervous and scared and so at that anyway, point. The long story made show, of course, my uh, tight end at, at Philadelphia was Charlie Young. Hmm. It's crazy how life comes around. And then my <laughs> rookie year, I'd, I'd always go up to him. I did this twice, my rookie. I could still remember saying it. I go, you know, Charlie, you need to thank me. It's because of me that USC moved you out of the middle linebacker position to tight end. It was because of my vicious... Crackback block. There you go. There you go. They didn't want me to kill you. And that's why you're playing tight end. And he would just laugh and laugh. And then uh, he, Charlie and I is one of my, he's one of my best friends. Yes, sir. And he invited me to, uh, 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 right before my uh, uh, one man play, we were working on it together. He invited me as Kenny Easley's uh, celebrity golf tournament in Seattle uh, for a three day golf tournament. He did this two years in a row. And we're meeting with Sam Cunningham, his best friend. Okay. And Charlie Young and, and Rod McNeil. <laughs> All these big, huge guys. But, you know, and, and we just had a blast there. And the whole time, every year I went with him, I would tell this story that how I was the reason <laughs> why USC moved Charlie. From yeah, tight, you're the reason. Like, tight, hey, you play tight, tight end because of me, middle buddy. linebacker to tight end. And Charlie would just, he would just start laughing <laughs> But anyway, Charlie, Charlie is. So anyway, that's 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 my story there. <laughs> OK, um, so my next follow up question. Right. Um, when at Stanford, did you n- notice that your your stock was rising and also that you were kind of like a, I guess, quote unquote, a larger than life image or persona? And how did that how did that transform your mind? uh being in, you know, just being in that space and being in college? You know, I, I just, I didn't really think much about it. Um, uh, it was just, I, I had probably the event that kind of did it is that mm-hmm. before my senior year, I got flown to Chicago for a photo shoot uh, with Playboy magazine. Shout out to Playboy. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I don't know if a Playboy is a big deal now, but that was a big deal. It was a big deal back and then. And so I was flown, all expenses paid, to have my picture taken with uh, the All-Americans. I was a Playboy magazine All-American. Lynn Swan was the USC wide receiver was was there, and I, I knew Lynn, and we talked and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I was there with... Uh, another one of the Stanford All-Americans. And so when I was there, uh, I just uh, went out. It was just pretty much disgusting because we had a uh, uh, dinner at the Playboy Club. Mm -hmm. Not going to go into detail. Of course. No problem. problem. But it was just really low life. And then this... The Stanford other American and I had said, let's get out of here. And we went to uh, uh, a nightclub. And um, 
he got asked to dance in a by very beautiful girl. And it just it was just very debauched. Everything okay. was debauched. And so I had to take a uh, cab back to my hotel room. And there alone in my hotel room, and I had this hotel room at the Playboy Penthouse Towers. I had never <laughs> seen a hotel room like this. Uh, mm. Open bar, and I, but I didn't drink. Okay. And it just, I, I just, the room was unbelievable. And I just remember very clearly uh, that particular night at the, at the Playboy Penthouse Towers is when I discovered the book of Isaiah. Hmm. And I started studying the book of Isaiah. And I mentioned this, I talked about this in my one-man play. Awesome. And, and see, I, right now, uh, I have four sons, and my, my sons call me Jeremiah because I I'm always what? reading the Bible. I don't watch TV. I'm always reading the Bible. And usually when my one son was last living with us, he'd go, Dad, what book? You, what are you reading in the Bible? And I go, I'm reading Jeremiah. And I'm always either reading Jeremiah or Isaiah. Okay. It's like it, they're both in my DNA. I mean, if you see Just, my, right. my Bibles, I've gone through three Bibles in my lifetime because hmm. uh, I write in them. Oh, awesome. Okay. Awesome. And I wear them out. But, uh, <laughs> okay. So I, I guess I thought... I, I knew I was a big deal, but I really didn't care. So, so it really just didn't. It didn't matter at that point. He was like, "Hey, look, look, yeah, I'm a quarterback. This is gonna, this, is, this it. is just what the Lord wants me to do." See, the Lord would kind of give me the directions because it was in 1970. Uh, in my book, uh, my favorite year, the the front cover says, "It was the best of times. And it the was worst the of worst time. of times. It was the season of hope. My year to be born again." That year I became born again. And from then on, whenever I made decisions of what I did, I just asked the Lord what direction to go. All right. Awesome. Well, this is a great segment for us to just take a quick break. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wiles, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. I'm here with Mike Barella. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're going to dive into some more questions. We're also going to talk about his NFL career and how that shaped him into being an Arthur and playwright. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, real quick. Make sure that you please, please, please subscribe to the channel, okay? The Like Minds Podcast on YouTube and on our Instagram, at Like Minds Pod. If you want to be on the show, you can actually click the bio in the Instagram, and it will take you to the link where you can fill out the form. And also, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you again, please make sure you go check out Mike Barilla on Amazon dot com and also at Barnes and Noble for all of his new products and new books that is coming out and that is already out right now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, back to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Wise and this is the Like Miles Podcast. We are back with Pro Bowler, NFL, just guy, Mr. Mike Barilla. How you doing today, Mike? It's great to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look, I'm glad. Look, the f the first part of this show has already been great. The the insight that you've been just giving about uh, just about life and your even your first memories and how that all that translates to you've had to transition so many times. And we're actually about to talk about some more things that you had to, uh, uh, sorry that, that you had to transition into. Uh, it's just gonna be it's just gonna be a great thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Just so you guys know, today's episode is all about starting over, and Mike here is a testament to that on multiple times, multiple occasions where you have to pick up the pieces. Um, so let's get back into it, right? So we discussed we discussed your high school, we discussed college. Now you're here, NFL, right? You, right. you you made it to the you made it to the pinnacle of success for an athlete that wants to play football. What was that transition like for you? How did you start over uh, and actually adapt uh, into the new programs of the NFL? Um, I, I can remember real well driving, getting in my car in in San Francisco. And going up to my favorite spot in San Francisco, which is Sausalito. Mm -hmm. And from there, I can see the uh, 
Golden Gate Bridge. And then to my right, I could watch the freighters come into the harbor, and I could see Alcatraz in the di distance. And this particular spot was my favorite spot in the Bay Area. And I went there the last time, and I said, this is the last time I'm ever going to see this. And that's where I used to have Bible studies. Mm, okay. I used to have Bible studies up up at that particular spot. And I had my last Bible study there on, on that hill overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. And then I got in my car, and I drove uh, from there all the way across uh, the United States uh, with my Bible in the seat next to me uh, to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, then when I got to Philadelphia, uh, I, I went there in, in, in May because, see, I was a red shirt, so I had graduated from Stanford, uh, and uh, I didn't have to go to classes. So I went there in May, and I started working out with the veterans in uh, uh, a martial art called Kung Fu. Gotcha. And so I was working out with the veterans uh, and being trained by a, a, uh, uh, a former Marine drill sergeant in, in martial arts Kung Fu, and I did that for three years. And mm. I'm really looking back and talking to the guys that are, are still alive, uh, it, having that physical toughness and the physical training of martial arts, I think really helped me. Was this before? Was this before? No, I, I was with Philadelphia. He was with Philadelphia had, at that point. I had, I had gotten traded there. Got traded already there. signed my gotcha. contract. Gotcha. I had met the coach, Coach McCormick, in the All-Star game, and he I really liked him. He really liked me, and he told me, I'm gonna I'm gonna draft you and he, he goes that's that's fine and then the uh, the World Football League put out a rumor that I'd signed with the New York team and uh, <laughs> of course and so he finally got a hold of me Mike did you sign with the New York Stars I go they've never talked to me and he goes okay we're gonna draft you in the here in and and real soon and then Cincinnati drafted me and and I go oh no I don't want to play for Cincinnati I wanted to play for Mike McCormick in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and so. I went to Cincinnati and met all the coaches and told them, if you don't trade me, I'm, I'm going to sign with the New York team. And so they traded me to Philadelphia because I wanted to be with Mike McCormick. So hey. then when I started training with the martial arts, it really helped me. And, and I was also meeting with one of the coaches, uh, Boyd Daller, who was a all-pro wide receiver for the Green Bay in film studies. Awesome. So I was actually living in a hotel uh, for th uh, two months uh, by myself, uh, working out five, six days a week uh, uh, with, with the players and throwing on, on, the, on the, the veterans uh, field, uh, veterans stadium field. And in the afternoons, uh, I would have film studies with the coach. And I actually took a, a, uh, a film projector and was in my hotel room uh, watching films uh, uh, in on the hotel wall as a quarterback what people don't understand uh, is quarterbacks have to uh, watch a ton of film a ton of and film and so they a just have no idea that it takes one of the reasons why I really wanted to, I was ready to leave football when I did was I was sick of watching so much film but a quarterback has to be able to look at the uh, uh, the, the defense. De defense and and look at the body lean of the strong safety and know that's going to be covered too. And then he looks over at the free safety and can see that he has his feet parallel as far as instead of one in the front and like that and knows that's going to be covered six. So you have to, that's the way you study films. Oof. So then when you drop back, you've already kind you of. You already made, know exactly already, where everybody's going to go. This is cover six. So you're going to probably have to look off the free safety to the left and then come back to the tight end on the right. That and, that and, type of play calling and just that type of thinking. You know, I wonder why they get paid. Yeah. They, it's, they're it's, they're it's, the top guys to get paid a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. A and lot of time. uh but anyway, I was I'm I'm more of a academic uh, uh guy. So uh uh one of the things that happened to me was uh and I went to Stanford and I, I've always read books. I've always been reading books and I got pegged when I got there as some type of intellectual uh, that was reading Russian novels and stuff like that. And, 
I remember asking this writer, go, how come you writing these articles about me being this, reading these Russian novels and being an intellectual and stuff like that? Because mm-hmm. they don't want to know that. They just want a single-minded quarterback. They want somebody they who don't, just, they don't just, want throw, you to have, just shut up and throw the ball. Yeah, they don't want to have anybody who has any of it. And he goes, well, Mike, you were the only guy. I've been on the, you, the Philadelphia Good Plains for six years. You're the only guy that I've ever seen read a book on there, and you would have two books. And I, because at that particular time, mm-hmm. I'd always be reading two books. Okay. I don't know what it was. It's just like you're just an avid I, reader. I, I would have, yeah, I'd have an avid read. My wife does the same thing now, but I, I was reading two books on the plane, and that's just the way it was. But anyway, so then I went to Philadelphia, and I slowly adjusted to life in Philadelphia. It's quite a. Quite what was a that like? And and tell and, and do you remember uh, your very first game? Your very first uh, game in Philly. So what was the transition like going the, into uh, Philly? Like, how was that Philly culture? What what did you have to adjust and what did you have to do differently being in that culture of Philadelphia? And also the second part of that question is um, your first NFL game. Do you remember that? I do remember it. And, and see, I was born in New York. There you go. I was born in uh, New York when my dad was uh, playing for the uh, New York Knicks. He was in Detroit the night I was born. So I, I, I'm used to back east, so wasn't intimidated back east. First game I played against, uh, I started in the last three games and uh, uh, was the Detroit Lions. And uh, I'll t- tell you, I remember that game. We mm-hmm. won that game, and I was the starting quarterback. But the game I'm going to tell you about was the second game. Okay. And, and the reason why I'm going to tell you about it uh, is because this particular game – was the muddiest game in the uh, modern history of the NFL. It was the last game in the Yale Bowl uh, of the New York Giants. Hmm. And it had rained for a day. And the field out there, I remember, I remember in the locker room, before, or maybe it was in the hotel, Boy Dowler, because he and I were, he goes, he came up to me and he goes, how are you in the mud, Mike? And I just remember thinking, because I had played at Stanford at Cal Berkeley in this really horribly muddy game. And we go, I'm fine. I have no problems with mud. There you go. And anyway, so this was, and the writers end up ended up calling it the Mud Bowl. The Mud Bowl. That makes sense. And there are, there's a highlight film that the NFL put out on me, I think six months ago. I have no idea why they put it out on me. And you'll see in there about, 10 of the highlights uh, there in that, that mud bowl game, because I was something like 21 for 26. And, but the story that I tell in my play is, and it's a true story. My best friend was our middle linebacker, Frank LeMaster. Hmm. He and I were rookies together. And, uh, this was the game where he almost drowned. And I'm not kidding you. um, he He almost drowned. He almost drowned in the game. And what happened was, uh, it's hard. For, I know when I talk about it now, people th- don't understand it, but it was so muddy. There was this big, huge mud puddle there in the middle of the field in about the third quarter. And it was about six to eight inches uh, of water, mud and water. And anyway, what happened, uh, Frank was the middle linebacker. There was a fumbled snap. Craig Morton was the quarterback, fumbled snap. Okay. The ball went on the ground, and then Frank dove on it. Right. Makes sense. He's on the ground, on the ball, and both lines of scrimmage jumped on top of him. Oh, got it. And he was under there for about 30 seconds. That should have been the end of it at that point. He could have drowned. He could have drowned. No, I'm serious. He, he told me, he goes, Mike, I almost drowned that game. Because I remember I was coming, I was on the field watching him come off. He go and he came up swinging. He just he just he just came. He had to fight uh, fight his I way probably to, was to get too, out of get off the, the ground. And he and he came off and he was just all covered with mud and water. And he almost drowned in the mud bowl. Mm. And the writers actually call it the mud bowl. Makes it's sense. Very, it's a very famous game uh, uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles uh, New York series. So anyway, we won that game. And then the last game was the Green Bay Packers, and we won that game. Awesome. So we won three games. But 
uh, the funny thing is the mud bowl because it was so muddy. It was just unbelievable. And I just had one of those charmed games. It was just like a kind of just like you were already in the zone. It was kind of already kind of just uh, like it's hard there. To, it's kind well, of hard to even explain uh, that. Uh, okay. Um, I was I was picking up things uh, like I – like I studied the films, like I said, and they had a they had a free safety, they had a strong safety, that on a particular coverage, cover six, he would be cheating to get to the far end of the field, mm. and so that would leave uh, our tight end open on a quick pop, and so I remember in a big time during the game, I caught I could see him cheating the free safety, uh, or the strong safety. And I called this quick pop audible to Charlie oh, yep. to gotcha. Charlie Young. Of all people. And he's <laughs> six five. Big guy. Six five, two forty five at that point. And and I, I remember it so well. You know, I just took two steps, drop back, and I just popped it to him right there. And then I watched this safety come up from way back there and try to tackle Charlie Young by himself. By and himself. I swear, by himself. Got to do better than that. And he, Charlie Young just about killed this guy. And so I knew this guy was a, this guy was all pro. Mm-hmm. So I knew he knew that I that I called an audible. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the next quarter, which was the fourth quarter, and the, the play that, that happened, in the huddle, I told our wide receiver on this particular pattern, uh, a deep post. Uh, he was clearing out you. So I said, make sure you run a good path, pass this time. And so what I did, I got up uh, to the line of scrimmage. And at that particular time, the way we called an audible was if the count was on two, and I go up the line of scrimmage and I go, 228. Mm-hmm. That means I'm changing the, uh, I'm play, changing to, the play to 28. Okay, got gotcha. you. I, I got gotcha. you. Okay. So my team knows that, and then they know uh, the count is on two. Okay, it's changed the play. And so I went up there, and what it was, the audible to, to uh, Charlie was 88. Okay? Okay. And I went up there, and I called, I called the play in the huddle on three. Okay. Okay. And so I went up there, just like before, and I go, two, 88. 288, because I could see him. You could see him moving. I could see, he had already moved to the cover six over there. And then as soon as I said that, he jumped right on top of Charlie Young. Because he knew at that point, he was like, oh, and yeah. And he was like three yards. And see, he was supposed to take the deep middle. And I had already called a play where Char- or Charlie Smith, or wide receiver, was running a deep post gotcha. where he was supposed to be. So I threw it to him, Charlie Smith, mm-hmm. because he came and popped to him. And he actually, I underthrew him by five yards, and he backed up into the end zone for a touchdown. There was nobody there. There was nobody there. because There was everybody, nobody in the middle of the nope. field. <laughs> he had come up. He th- and, and if you see this, this audible, you'll see this play where this wide receiver is backing up into the end zone for a touchdown on a catch. And that's because... Of a fake audible. So anyway, yes, sir. Another okay. story. Another, another, no, no, it's no worries. I love it. I love. I love to hear. Okay. And we love to hear because I think people can get a lot of just gems and a lot of knowledge just from just from these play calls. Um, so you're in the NFL, right? You're having the time of your life. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming at this point. Uh, how old are you at this point? Oh, let's see. Uh, probably. 23 to 27. Okay, 23 to 27. So or 26, yeah. How long did, did so did, did you only play for the Eagles or did you also get traded to other I, teams? I played as well? three years for the Eagles. Okay. And then I played two years for Tampa Bay. Gotcha. And, and then I the Lord told, told me to leave, uh, to leave and not look back. So that's what we can actually segment into. Yeah. So what uh if you can elaborate on it just really quickly, what prompted the the move to Tampa Bay? I, I had just the third year. I had set an NFL record for getting sacked the most times in a ten game period of a quarterback. And you I was, was re- you killed. was ready to go. You was I ready said, to go. I, I go get me out of here. 
I don't care where you send me. Just get me out of here. I mean, what better place than Florida? Nice and weather, then, palm exactly. trees. <laughs> and then, of course, Coach McKay was there, and I wanted to go there. He was the USC coach for Charlie Young. And so I went down to uh, Coach McKay land in t- Tampa Bay, and he's such a great guy. His son, uh, J.K. McKay, became, became a good friend, and he and I went to law school together. Mm-hmm. But I really liked Florida. I really liked going to to law school there. And awesome. I played there for two years. Okay, so your official timeline of NFL career was how long? Five years. Five years. You did five years in the NFL, and that's pretty kind of standard at that time. I'm assuming for just for just for NFL players in the in the style of play that was there. I know in modern times it's like way longer, but especially for that era, like of 70s. Well, actually, uh, you know, I became the. Uh, uh, player rep for the Eagles, so I, I knew all this stuff. Oh, nice. Uh, the average NFL career at that time was five years. The average NFL career, and most people don't know this, and I'm going to I'm gonna say, say it, this. Say it. And, and people go, oh, I, I've told this to people. They go, oh, I don't believe that. Tom Brady has played for 50 years. The average NFL career right now, and it has been this for 25 years, is 3.5 years. That's it. So for every year, honest to God, consume me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but I don't have any money. That's okay. <laughs> for no every worries. year of NFL bash ball that you play, it takes seven years off your average lifespan. Every year equates to seven years off your life. Right. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. It's a bad deal. That's a and bad that's, deal. That's so, why, but, but people that's sign why up I tell for that. People, everybody goes, Oh, they make so much money. No, they don't. It doesn't, it doesn't help you to, when you have money if your kids are taking care of you when you're 65 years old because you have CTE. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't It doesn't make any sense. Uh, like the, yeah. the, And these guys, they get paid these millions of dollars or at least in the hundred thousands of dollar ranges. And, you know, every Sunday they're getting hit. And, of course, as a, as a 23, 24, 25-year-old player, you're not thinking much of it, but if you're in your 30s right. playing this game, yeah, every hit counts. And then those hits add up. And then now, as you said, you're 65 years old if you make it. If you make it. That's if you make it to that age. Which you probably won't. Which you probably won't. So yeah. so the fact that if you even make it to that age, um, you're already, you're already kind of miserable. You're already kind of sad and down and depressed because, like, man, I can't function – how I even remember functioning when I was in my early twenties, or even in my early thirties. Um, okay, so let's go. Let's go forward. Okay. You five years in NFL, three years at in Philly, two years in Tampa, and then you you just leave. I, I left, and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I was so happy to get out of it, and okay. and I went to law school. I had actually uh, gotten accepted, taken the law boards and accepted into law school my second year, but then I got asked to play in the Pro Bowl. And I had already bought my books at New York Law School, paid my tuition. I said, I met with the, the, the dean. I said, can you just not, can I give you the books back? Because I just got asked to go to the Pro Bowl and the, the, my general manager wants me to play there. Yeah, makes and sense. And he goes, so that's fine. So I'd already taken the law boards, but I went to law school uh, the September, uh, the January, mid-year entry program mm-hmm. at Stetson Law School right after I quit. And for me, law school... Another transitional it, period yeah, for you. I, it's like basically who I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual. I'm a renaissance man. Mm-hmm. I loved law school. And did you know this... Prior, when you were just when you even first got no, into the league no, as a rookie, you don't really or, know. You know, you really. You, 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 did you, you have yeah. any inclination? He was like, well, actually, oh, when I when I was a senior in high, in high school, I remember hearing the Renaissance man word. Mm-hmm. What it was? Yeah. Who has a lot of interest? And I go, that's me, mm-hmm. and I just knew I was one of these guys that has a lot of interest. Uh, so I knew I wasn't going to spend too much time in in football because I wanted to go to law school. I had other interests. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I absolutely loved law school. The, I, there was about ten guys there in law school that I made friends with. We're still good friends to this day. 
Nice. We still, oh, yeah, we still. My wife and I went there back there to St. Pete uh, uh, three years ago and, and had uh, dinners with all these friends. And the thing about it is when you go to law school, None of them die. They're all doing really well. <laughs> like, yeah, None well, of them had any concussions. No, no, no you know, concussion, no nothing. All these l- lawyers that I, uh, you know, law school guys that are, you know, ages, my age, they're doing really well physically. It's just the football players that are crippled. <laughs> like <laughs> oh, you was, like uh, Marley, deader than a doornail. Oh, my gosh. But anyway, so we're still good friends. Really enjoyed law school. Graduated number two. In my law school class, I really liked it. I just had a blast. What type of law did you do? Uh, study? Uh, I, I became a, uh, um, I got a master's degree mm-hmm. in taxation, okay. which is a advanced law degree here at DU, and I became a pretty sophisticated international business tax attorney. What type of connections did you gain from just having? I just liked an intellectual challenge of. of uh, gotcha. Gotcha. And studying like that, and then I studied ac- asset protection trusts and and stuff like that, and did sophisticated stuff. And uh, I kind of liked law, but I, I just felt like it was a training ground for me. And that led you to your next phase, yeah. Of and I, Arthur, yeah, and it, it, no, that's exactly right. Okay, gotcha. and I, I go, this isn't me, and I, I quit and became a mortgage banker, and then I don't know how many times over the last. Seven or eight years, I Annie and my wife. I've talked to my wife, and I go, "I'm so thankful that the Lord sent me to law school." Hmm. I mean, you should see the documents that I had to review and sign to uh, have my musical played at the L.A. Calkins Opera House at the Denver Performing Arts Center. I can only imagine. I had to work with three different people there at the Denver Performing Arts Center. And they, this one lady talk, spoke to me, and she goes, you know, the night that I performed it there, and next to us was Phantom of the Opera. Right, okay. Right next to us. Right we next could, to us. We saw, the, right, yeah, the, we saw the, the, the people with their costumes. And she talked to me. She goes, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years, and you're the first time I've ever interacted with the playwright who's doing the contracts most of these companies send these sophisticated um, entertainment attorneys. Mm-hmm. And she goes, and I've noticed you've handled it really well. How did you do it? How do you do it? And I go, your, your preparation for yeah, law. Yeah, and I go, oh, I was an attorney, a tax attorney. Oh, she goes, oh, well, that explains it. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, not only has that happened, but I'm also negotiating contracts with Hollywood agents right now. Mm-hmm. Hollywood agents. Hollywood agents. Big Hollywood time, agents. Big time people. And, you know, I'm 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 negotiating these contracts. I'm reviewing these contracts. They're long. <laughs> you know, and you know, and you got to read them, but and so anyway, even though for me law was a struggle, practicing law. I loved law school. Okay. I go, "Thank God I did because I couldn't afford I don't know. I I did practice entertainment law. For a while, where I was flying out to uh, Beverly Hills, nice. meeting with John Frolls' attorneys, and those guys charged like five hundred and fifty dollars an hour, so Oof. I couldn't afford to hire a uh, entertainment attorney to negotiate my contract yeah. with with the Hollywood Hollywood uh, person. But why, when you had that experience, it just yeah, why, make, why, yeah, why, why would you that do I can that? do it? Yeah. So, and if if I mess up, I I'll just sue myself for malpractice. Exactly, you can sue for malpractice. <laughs> so, okay. You leave football, you go to law, you realize that law is not it. And then nothing for like 30 years, essentially. Right? Yeah. Or, okay, so nothing for 30 to 35 well, years. Of, no, I haven't I'm sorry. told you what I did for 30 years. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. P- please go into that. The major part of my life, the and it's my family's life, and Annie and I talk about this, uh, I was the director for 26 years. Okay. Of a Christian home for unwed mothers called Shannon's Hope. Here in, That's here, amazing. Here in uh, Colorado. And all my sons worked at, at there. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge part of my life, my family's life for 26 years. So I was not only an attorney for 26 years, 
I was also their attorney. Oh. And and when I finally had to quit to go uh, do my one man play, and Leslie goes, Mike, you can't quit. <laughs> we need you as the attorney. And I go, I got, I got to quit. I just, I'm, you gotta, I got to fly you, back. You, you gotta I do just you. can't have this hanging over my head because I was the guy. As their attorney, I would get these. I'm not going to go into detail. Right. I would get these phone calls on Sundays, Sunday afternoons, about different things that had happened, and I'd have to resolve them, you know, and threaten people and stuff like that. Right. And uh, but anyway, so I was a director of a home for unwed, unwed mothers for 26 years, Oof. and I never charged them a dime. Never. You like, never, ne- never, any, never, never sent an years. invoice. No. And yeah. I just loved it doing. It. Uh, the, one of the other directors was this guy, Cy Potabom, who was, I never really had a dad mm-hmm. uh, because uh, my dad was a psychopath and that's not really a father. Right. He, he, anyway, he was my, he was, he was there for 26 years. The reason why I kept, I couldn't quit was I just loved being around Cy. He was kind of like my father figure. Gotcha. He was a, he was a, protect, right. he was yeah. a father figure for you that actually helped you maneuver through life. Um, so 26 years for that. Um, and then I, my wife and I raised four boys, and this it was just wonderful. Dad, life will do that. Like time actually passes by way faster. Yeah, <laughs> and it happens quick. It happens so quick. Like one minute you're holding the baby, next minute they're eighteen, twenty years old, twenty one years old, and they're living their life. And it's like, huh, this is wild. I remember yeah. I, just like yesterday, I was just holding you. <laughs> yeah, wait till you, you they get older. My oldest son is this incredible businessman Mm -hmm. and of course he takes me on his business trip three months ago uh to uh uh, philadelphia for four days and we stay in the uh uh uh, four seasons hotel the the alignment that you have in your life is kind of (laughs) crazy Everything always, no matter how you look at it, it always correlates back to either Philly. Yeah, <laughs> and, no, and it, does, so, it does. It always, it, and I think, and I think those, and I think that's that's part of the. It's, it's just part of your journey, right? Like you, right. you have to. You got, uh, it's kind of like the phrase: you got to leave in order to come back, right? And so I think you, were, I think you actually came back in small portions, in small yeah. little dosages, right? To where that. You couldn't you couldn't hold it in anymore. You couldn't you couldn't. Right. God had led you to a point, and he was like, "Look, I need you to go back." Philadelphia is like this angel hanging over my life. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and the Lord showed me that uh, verse in Jeremiah chapter twenty nine uh, uh, about talks about go go to the city where I previously sent you and be a blessing to it. And I knew that meant to go back to Philadelphia. All right. So then, so now let's move into it. So now you, so now you're this playwright. I'm sorry. You, you saw, so you leave the law and you go become a playwright after 26 years of being an attorney. And what prompted that? And how did you even start that process? Like, what was your thinking? Did you just, outside of God, of course, um, but like, did you just wake up and be like, hey, I want to write. I want to write about me. I want to do a playwright. Well, oh, what was that process? What happened? I had a writing block that I was aware of since I was 18 years old at Stanford. I couldn't write creatively. Hmm. And then it was, uh, I think, 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago, uh, I would see these. I, like I said, I read the Bible all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, there's two verses. It's once in the Old Testament, and Jesus also uses it, where it says, touch nothing unclean. Okay, it says in the Old Testament, Jesus said, touch nothing unclean. Okay. And I, I ran in this verse like every week for like six weeks. And every time I read it, I would see this picture of my dad, Moose, with his number 12 New York Knicks jersey on it. So that did that did that symbolize for you that um something wasn't done like you it something wasn't resolved like you didn't heal properly or no he he was still he was still alive he was still alive at that point and okay. and what it meant to me was and I, I I finally ended up I had this episode where he blew up and everybody at this dinner and he just went berserk again 
that I, I made a decision when I came home and I, I kind of went before the Lord and said, you know, I'm never going to see him again. I'm never going to hear his voice again. Mm. And I'm never going to let him touch me again. He's always one of these touchy feely guys. Gotcha. When he ever made his point, he touched yeah, he it. Touched, it yeah. feels like a, a it's, it's part of our body yeah, language, uh, you know, yeah, electric yeah. eel, you know? And, and so I, I made that decision to not, see him, hear him again, and I just had this relief. Oh, good The Lord. weight just came off. I do not have to see him again. I do not have to be around him again. I'm, you know, it's like that verse. It says, you will know the truth. For the first time in my life, I admitted that he was a psychopath. And there's that verse that you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But anyway... I swear to God, within three weeks, it was three weeks uh, after I did that, I started writing my first play. And that, it was called, mm -hmm. it was about Joseph okay. in the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. multicolor cult fame. And I started it 13 years ago and finished it in September. And it's now with the publisher. It's called R1B. God's chosen DNA. That's, that's 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 touching for me, um, simply because you had to you had to release something, as you said, that creative block stifled you, and it took that long of a period of time. Forty years. It took forty years to for you to get here, and but again, God has no time. It's, it's, it's God's time, but it's not yours. Yeah, and so and so, therefore, you have to you have to look at it, and you kind of have to think about like, man, it took me this long, and it. Imagine if imagine if you had got rid of it, or I'm sorry, if it if you got relieved of that earlier. Imagine all the more that you could have done, but not just just nonetheless, you made you made it to a certain point, and it was kind of like another start over for you. Yeah, <laughs> it was a whole huge. nother huge start over. He was like, "Wow, I've stopped. I've stopped. I'm not. I'm not worried about him anymore. I'm not worried about the things that he did. Now I can actually flourish in my life. And now at that, and and now at this point, now you're flourishing. Uh, and that kind of reminds me of of this common phrase: "Let it go." Yeah, I don't think a lot of people do that. Uh, I think in, in order for you to start over, you have to let go of your past actions and past interactions and and say hey i'm a i'm a new person this is a new phase in me this is right. and this is why people i guess i guess like the how, how new year's is everybody wants to have some new year resolution um that's their way of doing it old baggage is is going right. away and we're new um so i just i appreciate you st uh, sharing that story uh and that's how the first book came around right the the, the disappearing well that one didn't come till that one I, I had done a, a scout of myself. Okay. And the first six things that I, I wrote were all very serious. Mm -hmm. And they were actually musicals. I'm not kidding you. They were you musicals. Wrote musicals? Yeah. That was your first They like, were all mu musicals. Your first writing experiences after all that? Six, the first six of them. Hmm. I mean, I wouldn't write the music, but I would select the music. Right. You select and the insert. music. And, and they were it. all musicals uh, because uh, my mom used to take me all these musicals, and I'd seen a lot of musicals. I love musicals. So they're all musicals. And I, I wrote my first six ones, and then I go, God, there's no comedy in here. Nobody's, there's no laughter in here. Yeah. And, and, and my wife is very funny. My sons are funny, and I'm funny at home. I go, I said, you got to write something funny. And that's when I started The uh, the Disappearing Quarterback. Or at that point, it was called QB. My first – and QB was my seventh play, mm -hmm. and, which became The Disappearing Quarterback. And that's the first one that ever had comedy in it. Sixty-five percent of it is comedy. He got it. Kind of, it kind of reminds me of like how you got to laugh at life. Yeah. yeah. If you don't, then it's yeah. like, yo, what are you doing? If you're not, if you're not laughing, um, if you're not, if you're not cracking a smile, at least, then your life, your uh, your lifespan is actually shorter. True. If you laugh, you actually yeah. live a little bit. You live longer. So I'm like, pretty true. sure That's during, true. Yeah. during this time frame, you've 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 laughed a lot. Oh yeah. And during the book of, of, of writing that stage play and writing that book, um, you oh, laughed, laughed my head off. You laughed your head oh, off. I laughed my head off. I was crying sometimes in Starbucks. I was when I I remember writing it because I'm a coffee shop writer. Right. Okay. Oh, and gotcha. I, and I was gotcha. writing the disappearing quarterback, 
And at this Starbucks, I remember it up in Castle Pines. And I was laughing so hard that I was crying. I mean, I was crying. I, I just, I just, I was just laughing. And there was this older lady, like, who was like about right, in, right not too far from me. And she was looking at me and I, and I go like, I think she thought I was having some type of nervous breakdown. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there watching her. And I couldn't help but laugh. And so I finally had to leave because she was starting to look at me like, are you okay? Are you all right? Like you're laughing, you're having too much fun over there. And <laughs> but, you uh, look a little weird. The but. same thing happened with this, my favorite year when I was writing about the Delta House fraternity. It's my second comedy is the, uh, my favorite year. Awesome. Well, look, we're going to, we're going to, you've given such great gems just within this conversation. Uh, I can't wait for our audience to hear it. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do an episode of Hot Seat. And our Hot Seat is actually where we're going to, where I'm going to ask you some tough questions. Uh, not too tough. Of course, tough. it's going to be lighthearted, but um, I always like to give that disclaimer on camera. If at any point that we need to stop, we will do that for you, sir. Um, but we're going to ask you some tougher questions just to get a little bit more insight into you as a person uh, and how that transformed your life. And we're going to have some fun doing it. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wiles, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. We'll be right back with Hot Seat, Mr. Mike Barilla. I appreciate you, sir. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Wise, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. And to my left, Mr. Mike Barilla. I just appreciate you, sir. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Wise. Of course, of course, of course. Now, of course, the red lighting tells it all. This is Hot Seat. Okay, well, we asked the real questions, and we're going to get some real answers today. Um, again, as a disclaimer, I always like to say on camera, if at any point of the conversation you need to stop, we'll do so just to accommodate you and make sure you are the most comfortable. But these questions that I'm asking is just to dive a little bit deeper, uh, you know, just deeper uh, past the surface level just to have some understanding. So we'll start off light, and then we'll go a little bit heavier, okay? Um, So... First question is actually from our cameraman, Brian. He has some questions that he wanted me to ask. Uh, what was your relationship like with your head coach of the Eagles, Dick Vermelli? Or Vermel, sorry. Uh, well, okay, I had two head coaches, Mike McCormick, mm -hmm. the first two years, who was like a father figure to me, and I really liked him. Dick was a little bit different in that uh, it was his first year in the NFL, and uh, – we had a terrible year, uh, mm -hmm. and so it was strained. But, you know, he was a nice guy. He was a quarterback coach. Interesting story that I have about Dick um, is that I didn't go back to Philadelphia for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lord told me not to go back. And so uh, I finally went back uh, after 35 years to meet with my artistic director because he had some changes to my one-man play. Okay. So I'm flying back to Philadelphia. First time in 35 years. Haven't been back there for 35 years. And I'm sitting uh, in the airport waiting for my shuttle to take me to bed and breakfast. And I remember I was sitting there. I'd been on the ground for about eight minutes. And I was thinking, I go, I wonder if I will run into any, or recognize anybody or run into anybody that I knew back 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, no, nah, I won't because they'll be 35 years older <laughs> and I won't recognize them. Right. Okay. Honest to God, as I was thinking that, right in front of me walks Dick Vermeil. And this is the only time I've ever done this in my life, but totally inappropriately, because I was so shocked that I was seeing Dick Vermeil walk in front of me, and he was holding, you know, a, a luggage thing, you know, to to take to the baggage claim. Mm -hmm. I screamed out his name. I go, Dick Vermeil. He throws his hands up in the air. I go, oh no, because he's like he's a little a lot older. He's a lot me. older. <laughs> and he, I go, oh no, I gave him a heart attack. 
Oh, that's and, the front. And, that's the right. And I go, I go. Oh God, no. That's probably and not go, a good look. Oh, Dick, I'm so sorry. I just was so surprised to see you. And I hold out my hand, and it, and I go, Mike Barilla. And he looks at me, and goes, Mike. You're living in you're living in Denver. You have four boys, and you're an attorney, right? He knew that. Just he, yeah, he already, go, that was kind of kind of crazy. Sitting there, I go, oh my, oh yeah, uh, yeah, I am. I do live in a D- Denver, and I, I'm married, happily married. We have four boys, but I'm no longer an attorney. I'm a playwright. I'm writing plays. And he looked at me and goes, oh, that's right. Frank told me you're writing plays. <laughs> but anyway, he knew everything about me. <laughs> he knew everything I just already. I could not believe it. And I remember I asked Frank about it. I go, Frank, how does he know about me? He goes, Mike, he follows his players. He follows their lives. And he, he, he knew all about me. He knew I lived in Denver. Mm-hmm. He knew I had four boys. He knew you were an accountant, an, an attorney. An attorney. Well, I and I still was an attorney, but I, I, I was starting to call myself a playwright. Right. You know, and so anyway, it was very interesting and a, a neat guy. And I ran into him the next day. Very nice, very friendly guy. He's he, he's he's well he's liked by most of the players. Which is always a good. Yeah, always I having mean, that relationship, he's, he's having a, a good uh, relationship with players. He's a, a player good. coach. Yeah, and players coach. That's what Vince you call it. Vince Papali, yep. um, the uh, the guy that made the movie Invincible. He and, and Dick are really good friends, and That's I, where, I I still okay. talk Got I it. still talk to uh, uh, Vince. I actually talked to him a couple of weeks ago, and you know he's real close to uh, close to Dick. And it, that movie was called the it was called Invincible. I saw I saw that movie. I loved it. I love I loved that movie. I love the story of it and how that just came to be. It's so just a great rise uh, a rise above it all story. Yeah, it's a good story. I, lo- I love the and story. And he's still a good guy. He's, he's a good, a good guy. guy. Um, my next question for you. It's going to get a little bit deeper. Um, the worst point of your NFL career as a quarterback. Worst point? Worst oh. point. Oh, it would probably have to do with uh, uh, concussions. Uh, okay. No, actually, probably it would be... Uh, Dealing with the the uh, psychopathic people there, uh, we had a player. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to get. Um, no, I don't have I'm to say that. Name. But he was beating name. up his wife, mm. and and he was a big, huge defensive lineman, and she s- stabbed him and killed him uh, two, two days after the end of the third season. Oh my gosh! And then during that s- third season, when Dick. Uh, my second season, we had uh, a player who uh, attacked one of my offensive linemen in practice. Uh, he was trained in kung fu and knew how to kill kill people with bare hands. And uh, he tried to uh, poke his eyes out in the practice field. And all the coaches had to jump on top of him. And I still remember Coach McCormick yelling, Bill, not the eyes. And this offensive lineman, Roy Kirksey, mm. got sent to the hospital for for two weeks that and that's I think one of that's, the that's the worst part that's of the worst my part pro is dealing with those type of personalities because i mean was that was that was that from just the game itself or was that from the hits that they kept having what what, what, what do you think that that's a good question because i think with the defensive lineman uh, and beating up his wife that's a common characteristic of having cte Mm. chronic traumatic encephalopathy so i suspect both of the 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 things that i just described there was from the ct beginning stages of cte the the head damage Mm. see when people have brain damage the cte Mm -hmm. they're pretty dangerous to people right because they can't they're not in the right they they can totally they could totally nobody's in the red line at that point, right? Yeah, it's it's happening all the time. So I think you're right. Good point. It was, pro- it was probably from the C- beginning of the CTE for both of those incidents that I described there. Man, man. Um, so so that's it's hard, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to even think about and look at because now 
I mean, well, now it's safer for NFL players now. No, it's not. To some degree. Okay. Thank, they, they, thank say, you for they, say they say that, so thank they, you for correcting me. They are lying, and they have learned what uh, the propaganda ministry of the uh, Nazi regime said. Say something over and over and over again, and people will believe it. Roger Goodell says that over and over. Football has never been safer. Football has never been safer. Football has never been safe. I mean, yeah, you start to believe Football it after a while never, because, like, if, and then, because nobody backtracks the information. No, no. Like, the, even the – Everybody like, even, believes it. Even with the technology, like uh, – that we have for football now, like the helmets have better cushionings and pads or something. Yeah, have oh, you oh, seen oh, yeah. Apparently. Have you seen those practice helmets they wear? I have not seen it, no, sir. Well, look them up. They're big, huge things. And I go, they go, well, we wear these in practice because they're safer. I go, why don't you wear them in well, games? In, in games, yeah. Oh, well, it would affect our ratings, which would affect our bottom line. Oh, I see. Yeah, you care about your you care about your capital. You care about yeah. your money. They have these big, huge, padded helmets that they wear in practice. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, now I'm yeah, thinking about they, it. They yes, have I've seen they those. They don't wear them in games. Though. They don't wear Why them in not? games. Well, it it doesn't look as cool. So it doesn't well, matter. Well, the highlight films would look really good, and you know, ABC wants it to have those cracking sounds. Mm. Exactly. So they they need that. So people can. It's it's a whole thing that goes along with it. So I thank you for even clarifying that and actually correcting me. Um, my next my next big question for you: When did you know after football, or or sorry, or even during football, that your life changed, or actually just in general? This may be a more of a, of a general question, but when did you know in your heart and in your mind? Yeah, my life is not about to be the same. And uh, when did that happen? For well, you? that happened to me when I was a uh, uh, in 1970 uh, when I became a I became a believer. When I turned my life over to God, mm -hmm. I knew my life was never going to be the same again. I had two major changing uh, changes in my life where my life totally changed. One was that event there, and the other one was when I met my wife Annie. Awesome. Awesome. You know, and and what what I talk about in one of my uh, uh, books, the case of the Supreme Quarterback, mm -hmm. is the uh, book uh, Genesis, which talks about the two becoming one flesh. Well, Annie and I, when we got married, we became one flesh, and it's, that's why one of the reasons why I wrote that that book w to talk about that verse, because people now, these young people, they don't get married anymore. Yeah. They just, Serial shacking up, pretty much. A lot of people that I, a lot of people that we know, and I just go, what? Why? What happened? And and so anyway, uh, one of the reasons why I wrote the case, two reasons why I wrote the case of disappearing quarterback. One was the two shall become one flesh in Genesis, mm -hmm. and the other one was to reveal uh, my uh, teacher at, at at Regis, who mentored me in in Latin and religion, Father Bakewell. Who was the multi-millionaire heir hmm. of the Bethlehem Steel Fortune, who gave up all that money and took a vow of poverty to teach us that? Yes, I, I read that from the book. And that's yep. those are the two reasons why I wrote that book. I made uh, Father Bakewell a major character in that book, mm -hmm. just because I wanted young people to know. It's not about money. It's never about money. It's never about it's money. Never, it's never going to be about money. I think it's, it's always about the connections that you make. Yeah. It's all about the people that you come across and the impact that you're going to leave on the world. Yeah. Money it's, is the afterthought, and we're, we're in times now where that money may not even be a play. Oh, it's right. It's not going to it's, be a it's play. It's not going to be right. You're just going to have a chip. I'm just going to have a chip, a chip on probably your hand. Go, I'll take a couple of chocolate candy bars. Put your hand there in this. That's camera. crazy to think about. That's crazy to think about. Um, I wrote can, about that in my book, Mark of the Beast, that which will be published this month. Consistently working, I love it, and and I I just I thank you, sir, because you you the the again the information and the knowledge that you're giving, it's really really just out of this world, and you you kind of need to soak it up. Everybody, y'all need to soak it up. This information here is everything. Um, I have one more. Hot seat question, um, and then, and and then definitely we're going to get into some 
uh, just some like you know some promo and everything. But last question uh, that might hit a little bit home for you, but uh, just let me know. How did your relationship with your father hurt you down the line? Oh, I I'm not sh- sure if if it hurt me. If it did, if it didn't, then yeah, cool. I I don't look at that as being hurting me because it helped me become an actor. And the other thing that happened, which was so good, is I got away from him when I was 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, I when my mom took me out to the airport to fly to Stanford, mm-hmm. I pretty much got away from his influence. Mm-hmm. But uh, as far as how it hurt me. You know, it's just like it made it such a battle. A battle for, I, for, for everything. Whatever I wanted to do, whenever the Lord told me to go to right, my dad told me to go to the left. So it was a constant battle. And so that may have hurt me there, but to a certain extent, it toughened me up mm-hmm. and got me ready for the major league psychopaths I dealt with. Like the owner of the Eagles was a psychopath. Hmm. So I had to deal with psychopaths wherever I went. So to be around my father, it kind of trained me to to help deal with him. The owner of the Eagles, talk about him in, in my play, but it's hard to believe, but he was uh, um, a compulsive gambler, alcoholic, okay. chronic romanizer. Okay. And honest to God, he lost $56 million playing blackjack at Atlantic City Casino. Your owner? The owner of the Eagles. And had to sell the Eagles to pay off his gambling debts. Are you and, serious? Yeah. That's and so when I wild. talk about it in my play, and I talk about all the list of things that they foreclosed on that he lost. He lost his house in Acapulco. He house, lost his huge house in the main line. Mm-hmm. He lost his two Bentleys. But the main thing he lost, the most important thing he lost was his soul. And once you lose your soul, Mm. you don't ever get it back. Jesus said it best, what good does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses nothing or has nothing? And loses his soul. And my father, Mr. Toast, they lost their souls. And it doesn't do you any good to make a lot of... So anyway, being with my dad helped me prepare me for dealing with Mr. Toast. This has been the most comedic and lighthearted hot seat that I've ever been a part of. I'm happy that uh, I'm happy that it wasn't too deep. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Hot Seat, Mike Barilla. And when we come back, um, we're going to do message of the day. But we're also going to have Mike here give us some... Uh, some inspiration to all young writers uh, and everybody in the entrepreneur field uh, and just just any motivational things that he may want to say to the people just to motivate you and to get you right. It's okay to start over. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wise, and this is the Like Moms Podcast, and this was Hot Seat. We'll be right back. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, real quick, make sure that you please, please, please subscribe to the channel, okay? The Like Moms Podcast on YouTube and on our Instagram at Like Moms Pod. If you want to be on the show, you can actually click the bio in the Instagram and it will take you to the link where you can fill out the form. And also, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you again, please make sure you go check out Mike Barilla on Amazon.com and also at Barnes and Noble for all of his new products and new books that is coming out and that is already out right now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Back to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Wise, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. To my left, I have Mr. Mike Barilla, former, former just Philadelphia Eagles superstar quarterback. Let's just let's just go ahead and say that. Let's just knock that out the park really quickly. Uh also Arthur Playwright, uh attorney. Pretty much everything. You, the the uh, a, a Renaissance man, the definition, correct? Right. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, really quick, uh, I just want to just give a major shout out to to Mr. Mike 
uh, Barilla for being here. And Mike, I want to leave the floor open. I want to ask you this question and then I want you to lead in to anything that you want to showcase, uh, especially like the new book, any new playwrights, anything of that sort. So my question to you is just to, just to end the show great. Um, what do you tell aspiring writers? I tell writers to write from the heart. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know what that means, I tell them to pretend that they are 75 years old and they have gone to the doctor and the doctors told them that you only have three months to live. So you need to go back home and get your affairs in order. And so write like these are going to be the last words of your life here on planet Earth. And every single book that I've written, I do not, even the very first one, I did not write it like this is the first book that I've ever written. Mm -hmm. I wrote it like it, it was going to be the last book that I would ever write. Every book that I've written, I go into it thinking, this is it. This is the last book you're ever going to write. Write what you have inside you. Write what is important to you. And so even if you, this is your first book come out, you write it like it's your last book. And, and leave your mark here. Uh, hmm. on the planet. I have two books. Actually, I have five books that are going to be publi published this year. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about two of them. Uh, the main one is The Case of the Disappearing Quarterback. Uh, came out in January. It's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all sorts of other places. And then a recent one is uh, My Favorite Year. Uh, and Please know what I use the same uh, uh, title as a, a, one of my favorite movies in 1993, Peter O'Toole movie, My Favorite Year. Year. So in order to find it, you have to Google my name in front of it, Mike Barilla, B-O-R-Y-L-A. And with that, I uh, created with uh, my producer a video trailer called My Favorite Year because that is what people are doing now with books. Uh, also right now, next month, uh, Mark of the Beast is coming out. And then in January, uh, R1B, God's Chosen DNA, will be published. And then in March, Image of the Beast will be published as well. So those are five books and, uh. That's what I have going on. Mike, thank you. Thank you for the information that you've given. Thank you for all the gems that you've dropped. And uh, your story is truly impeccable. It's truly amazing how you've, you've had to transition. You've had to start over. And you're just now living, at least, at least from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, I think that's the greatest testament. This life journey, man, it really is. It's a journey. The destination doesn't even matter. And the journey that you are on, you're, you're, you're helping, you're making an impact, and you are changing lives by your story. That's why you had to go through it, because you had to be a testament and a, you know, you had to give a testimony to, to, to you know, to somebody else that's coming up right behind you and say, right. hey, watch this. This is what you don't do. This is how you can start over. This is how you can do better uh, and learn from my mistakes. And so, Mike, again, thank you for just being here. I'm going to give you your flowers while we are both in this flesh. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Um, you are a great man just by our conversation alone, and I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with message of the day my name is wise and this is the like my podcast the like minds podcast and this is mr mike barella
Now, ladies and gentlemen, on to message of the day. And I'm going to keep it very simple. In order for you to start over, you have to leave behind your past actions. Even Mike said it today off camera to me. Forget your past and look forward to your future. It's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. If you really want to go somewhere, if you really want to go better than what you better than what you are, then you have to forget your past. In order for you to start over, you have to forget your past. Because you can't go forward if you keep looking back. My name is Wise, and this is the Like Minds Podcast. Until next time, peace. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, real quick. Make sure that you please, please, please subscribe to the channel, okay? The Like Minds Podcast on YouTube and on our Instagram, at Like Minds Pod. If you want to be on the show, you can actually click the bio in the Instagram, and it will take you to the link where you can fill out the form. And also, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you again, please make sure you go check out Mike Barilla on Amazon dot com and also at barnes and noble for all of his new products and new books that is coming out and that is already out right now Randy Corson. Randy Corson. Keep on, keep on, keep on. Shine, shine. Randy Corson. Randy Corson.